Hello and welcome to the eighth video in this series. So this video is going to be a little bit intense if you're not familiar with Python and programming. What we're going to do in this video is we're going to build on what we've done before and we're actually going to save a load of historical data for different currency pairs. I've made a little bit of preparation to make a head start here. I've created inside the root of our project folder a folder called his underscore data that's empty at the moment. Started another notebook just by duplicating test called it save candles, doesn't matter what you call it, but we have imported request defs pandas as pd, got a session up and running here. I've loaded in our instruments data frame which we prepared in previous videos and I've also made a list called our cursor for our currencies and this is the currencies that we're going to be interested in trading. So we've got the euro, US dollar, pounds, yen, uh, Swiss franc, New Zealand dollar and Canadian dollar. Now, the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to get all possible tradable combinations of these pairs. So when we look at the instrument data frame, we can do a lot of things and we'll see throughout the course just how powerful data frames are. But if I type instdataframe.shape, we get here what's known as a tuple back in Python. It's a bit like a list where we get the first value is the number of rows and the second value is the number of columns. If I just want to take the first value, I can use the index zero and square brackets and I get the number of columns. I can also ask for something called info on the data frame or in off if I want to get it in incorrect. And it tells me it's a data frame with 124 entries and it tells me for each column what the data type is and how much memory is used and things like that. We don't need to worry about that for now. We'll come across that uh, again later on in the course. The reason I'm showing you this is because other things we can do on the data frame that are relevant now. If we do ins underscore df and dot columns, we get a list of all of the columns in our data frame. And the one I'm interested now is the name because I want to know what pairs we can actually trade. With the data frame, I can get a list of unique pairs by typing name.unique. And you can see very quickly, it gives all of the unique pairs that are available to trade. And we can use this feature to actually get ourselves a list of all the pairs that we want to trade. So to do this, we need to do a couple of loops. So in the place of this unique statement here, I'm just going to paste in a couple of loops because I'm conscious of the time in this video, there'll be a bit of copying and pasting of code. And what we have here are two loops nested inside each other. The first one, or both loops, loop through the our cur. So the first one saves the value in P1, the second one in P2. So what will happen here is P1 will be Euro, and then P2 will be Euro. It'll create the pair of Euro underscore Euro and print it to the screen, which is what you see here. Then the next loop, P2 will now be US dollar, P1 will still be Euro, so we'll get Euro underscore US dollar and so on. So this gives us all possible combinations, all the things in this list. Now, of course, Euro Euro doesn't really exist. We're not allowed to trade that GBP, GBP, etc., etc. So what we want is just to get the pairs that we know we can trade. And the way we can do that is we can use this unique that we just looked at. So we can say that if our pair is in our instrument data frame dot name dot unique, then we'll print our pair. And now you can see we get a much shorter list of all the proper pairs that were available to trade. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to use the code that we've used in test.ipynb before to go through all of these combinations and save 4,000 candles into file that we can use for some historical analysis and back testing. That's not a lot of candles, but for now it'll do. So to go about doing this, we're going to have to write some functions. Now, if you're familiar with Python, you'll know about this. I apologize if you're not, you won't. But you've already been using functions. This read pickle here with these curly braces is a function. It's defined. There's a piece of code that executes when we call this, which is what's happening here. We've sent it a parameter, which is the name of the file. And some code somewhere else that we didn't write has been written. It's code inside this function has created and saved the file for us. A similar thing goes on when we use print. That's also a function built into Python. Again, it takes some, takes some parameters between some brackets and does something, in this case, printing to the output, whatever we've put inside the brackets. And in the same way, I want to move the code that we've written for getting data from the OANDA API and getting a candles data frame. I want to move that into functions so that we don't need to paste and repeat all of the code for every one of these pairs. So making some space, the first function we're going to write is the function that actually fetches candles from the OANDA API. So we're going to give that function a name fetch candles. So def tells Python that we're defining a function, then we have a space, the name of the function, and then separated by commas, we have the parameters that we're sending in to this function that it can then use. What we'll do then is we'll build up our URL, as we have done in previous videos, we want the forward slash instruments forward slash candles, 
except in the place of instrument here I want the pair name because that's the pair the name of the sorry that's the name of the pair that we're going to be fetching from the API we then want to set up our parameters as we have done before we'll use the count parameter that's sent in the granularity that's sent in and the reason we're doing it with parameters like this is that we can change it later on and still reuse the same function we don't want to hard code the count or the granularity here we can then get our response just as we have done previously and last but not least when this function is executed we want to send something back to whatever has executed this function so we want to return something and we're going to return two things we're going to return the status code and the JSON. Why are we returning that and not just the JSON? Well, we're going to make sure the status code is 200 after our request, because if it isn't, we know that something has gone wrong. So let's just quickly test this out down here. So let's just test this out down here then. So we'll say that code comma res for response is equal to fetch candles. We'll do the euro US dollar. Count can be 10 and the granularity can be H1. Now it's executed, I'll just make some space here, and the first thing is to type code, and you can see the code is 200, which is good. Let's do res, and you can see that we've got our response. So this function is working okay. The next function we want is the one to actually turn the data into a data frame, and this we've seen before, so again I'm going to paste most of this in. We define another function, this time get candles data frame. this will take in the JSON. We'll have our lists of our prices and our OHLC, and I'm going to take the same code that we've used in the previous video, I think it was, in test.ipynb. Let's just scroll somewhere. Yes, this code from here. And instead of printing our data, we're going to return a new data frame made from the Our Data Dictionary. So everything's the same as it was in the previous video. We're making our data. We're looping through all of the candles in the response. We're building everything up exactly as we did here. But instead of printing it then to the screen, what we're doing is putting this line on here like we did before to make up our data frame and then returning this data frame from the function. So whenever a piece of code calls this function with a JSON response sent in as an argument, we will get a candles data frame back. So let's give this a quick whirl as well. To do that, we'll do the same as before. We'll fetch some candles. And now we have our response, we can call the get candles data frame function with our response, which is our JSON response as the parameter. Say df is equal to that. And here I got an error saying candles data frame is not defined. And the reason is I forgot to actually execute the cell where I've defined the function. So I'll execute that. And now the function should exist. And we can see that hopefully now everything is run. If I do df.head, we have our data frame with all of our prices inside. So we've written two functions now. We've got one function that allows us to fetch candles from the OEnder API, and we've got another function that allows us to create a data frame from a response from the OEnder API. The next function we want to create is we want to create a function. I'll just delete all of these here. We want to create a function that saves the data frame to file. This is very, very simple. For a given data frame with a pair name and granularity, we're going to save into this hist data folder we've created with the pair underscore the granularity to a pickle file like so. Again, it's code you've seen in somewhere in the previous uh, video. Here it is, to pickle like so. So I'll execute that cell so I don't forget. And last but not least now, we can start to look at how to create our data. So the last function we're going to have is a function that's going to bring all of these three together. Because if you think of the process, we will loop through all of the pairs that we want to trade, all of these. And for each one of these, so in this line here, we want to set the whole process going of getting the candles from the API and then saving the file into his data. So we need one last function that puts all of this together. So we'll call this function create data. And then we're going to say that our code status code and our JSON data is equal to fetch candles. The pair will be sent in as the name. We'll fetch, let's fetch 4,000 candles. I think you can do up to 5,000 according to the documentation at once. If you want to do more than that, you have to break everything up by date. We'll come to this later on in the course and for our given granularity here. Once we've got that back, what we do need to do is check whether the code is 200 because it isn't, we'll just print error and return from the function. So we'll check here, have we got the status code 200? If not, we'll print the pair name and error to the console and return because something has gone drastically wrong. Otherwise, what we can do is we can get our data frame. And what we can then do is we'll print a line to the screen just to say what we've recovered. And here I'll explain what this line is. And again, I'm pasting the code in just to save a little bit of time in this one. This is obviously available on GitHub. It's in the video description, the link to GitHub. 
So here I'm printing a formatted string, the pair name loaded, the data frame that we got back, the number of rows, candles from, and here I'm taking the time column of the data frame and getting the minimum value to, and then the time column again of the data frame, I'm getting the max value from the data frame. Don't worry too much about the min and max. We're going to be covering a lot more with data frames later on in the course when we start doing our strategies and testing. Last but not least, then we need to call our save file function to save the file into his data. So now we have our create data function ready to go. The last thing we need to do then is actually call this create data function inside our loop. So I'm going to take the create data here, open brackets. The first thing we want to send in is our pair that we've created, and then we want to give it the granularity. And we'll take one hour candles here. And what we can see is it's scrolling away and you can see just how quickly it's loading the candles. The reason we have 3999, of course, is because we're eliminating the incomplete latest candle. And that's already done. And hopefully if you're used to trading manually or analyzing this kind of data manually, this has been very eye-opening for you. We've just saved a load of pairs, each one 4,000 candles, in a matter of three or four seconds. And you can see that each data frame here is running from around the 8th of August up to the 29th of January, which is today. And the times, remember, are in UTC, Universal Central Time, I think, or GMT is also the same. And if we go to the top left hand side, you can see that in his data, we've got a huge amount of historical data now that we can play with to start looking into our trading strategies and our backtesting. So hopefully that's all more or less made some sense. It was quite intense. We don't actually have any code that we haven't seen already in the previous videos. We've just put this code into some functions so that we can deal with loading data a little bit better. This still, of course, is not best practice for coding to have all the code inside a notebook. At a later date, we will be moving all of this code into a script, into a class, and dealing with everything a little bit better. But step by step, bit by bit, in the next video, I think we can actually take a dive into looking at a couple of strategies. So thanks very much for watching. Any problems, questions, comments, always welcome underneath the video on YouTube. Otherwise, see you in the next one.